seen. I'm not going to get very technical about this for any of you who are voice coaches. You can locate your voice, however. So if I talk up here in my nose, you can hear the difference. If I go down here in my throat, which is where most of us speak from most of the time. But if you want weight, you need to go down here to the chest. You hear the difference? We vote for politicians with lower voices. It's true. Because we associate depth with power uh, and with authority. That's a register. And we have timbre. It's the, the way your voice feels. Again, the research shows that we prefer voices which are rich, smooth, warm, like hot chocolate. Well, if that's not you, that's not the end of the world. Because you can train. Go get a voice coach. And there are amazing things you can do with breathing, with posture, and with exercises to improve the timbre of your voice. Then prosody. I love prosody. This is the sing-song, the meta-language that we use in order to impart meaning. It's root one for meaning in conversation. People who speak all on one note are really quite hard to listen to if they don't have any prosody at all. That's where the word monotonic comes from, or monotonous, monotone. Also, we have repetitive prosody now coming in, where every sentence ends as if it were a question, when it's actually not a question, it's a statement. <laughs> and if you repeat that one over and over, it's actually restricting your ability to communicate through prosody, which I think is a shame. So let's try and break that habit. Pace. I can get very, very excited by saying something really, really quickly, or I can slow right down to emphasize. And at the end of that, of course, is our old friend, silence. There's nothing wrong with a bit of silence in a talk, is there? We don't have to fill it with ums and ahs. It can be very powerful. Of course, pitch often goes along with pace to indicate arousal, but you can do it just with pitch. Where did you leave my keys? Where did you leave my keys? It's a slightly different meaning in those two deliveries. And finally, volume. I can get really excited by using volume. Sorry about that if I startled anybody. <laughs> or I can have you really pay attention by getting very quiet. Some people broadcast the whole time. Try not to do that. That's called sodcasting. <laughs> Imposing your sound on people around you carelessly and inconsiderately. Not nice. Of course, where this all comes into play most of all is when you've got something really important to do. It might be standing on a stage like this and giving a talk to people. It might be proposing marriage, asking for a raise, a wedding speech, whatever it is. If it's really important, you owe it to yourself to look at this toolbox and the engine that it's going to work on. And no engine works well without being warmed up. Warm up your voice. Actually, let me show you how to do that. Would you all like to stand up? for a moment. I'm going to show you the six vocal warm-up exercises that I do before every talk I ever do. Anytime you're going to talk to anybody important, do these. First, arms up, deep breath in, and, and sigh out, like that. One more time. Very good. Now we're going to warm up our lips, and we're going to go ba, 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 ba. Very good. And now, just like when you were a kid. Now your lips should be coming alive. We're going to do the tongue next with exaggerated la, 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 la. Beautiful. You're getting really good at this. And then roll an R. That's like champagne for the tongue. Finally, and if I can only do one, the pros call this the siren. It's really good. It starts with we and goes to or. The we is high, the or is low. So you go, Fantastic. Give yourselves a round of applause. Take a seat. Thank you. Next time you speak, do those in advance. Now, let me just put this in context to close. This is a serious point here. This is where we are now, right? We speak not very well into people who simply aren't listening in an environment that's all about noise and bad acoustics. I have talked about that on this stage in different phases. What would the world be like if we were speaking powerfully to people who are listening consciously in environments which were actually fit for purpose? Or to make that a bit larger, what would the world be like if we were creating sound consciously and consuming sound consciously and designing all our environments consciously for sound? That would be a world that does sound beautiful and one where understanding 
would be the norm. And that is an idea worth spreading. Thank you. Thank you. And how are you? Today starts a program just for you from the Salina Media Connection. People from the Salina community are getting together for a program where they'll be telling stories, dancing, singing, all kinds of fun stuff. And because it is just for you, we're calling it the Kids Connection. It's going to be on every morning at 10 a.m. Monday through Friday. It's about arts, health, wellness and education. Like I said, lots of fun stuff you'll want to see. Again, it's on Monday through Friday at 10 a.m. The Kids Connection, just for you. Come on, join in. I know you'll have fun. Drummer Pete was keeping a beat, playing on a drum and having some fun. Steady beat is really sweet, you can do it when there's one. Pete asked one more to keep a beat, playing on a drum and having some fun. Steady beat is really sweet, you can do it when there's two. That's one more to keep a beat, playing on a drum and having some fun. Steady beat is really sweet, you can do it when there's three. Beat that's one more to keep a beat, playing on a drum and having some fun. Steady beat is really sweet, you can do it when there's four. That's one more to keep a beat, playing on a drum and having some fun. Steady beat is really sweet, you can do it when there's five. Beat, that's one more to keep a beat, playing on a drum and having some fun. Steady beat is really sweet, you can do it when there's six. That's one more to keep a beat, playing on a drum and having some fun. A steady beat is really sweet, you can do it when there's seven. Beat, that's one more to keep a beat, playing on a drum and having some fun. A steady beat is really sweet, you can do it when there's eight. That's one more to keep a beat, playing on a drum and having some fun. Steady beat is really sweet, you can do it when there's nine. Beat, that's one more to keep a beat, playing on a drum and having some fun. Steady beat is really sweet, you can do it when there's ten. Drummer Pete was feeling kinda weak, keeping a beat has got him beat. He stopped playing and keeping the beat, 10 minus 1 leaves 9 on the beat. Drummer 2 was feeling kinda weak, keeping a beat has got him beat. He stopped playing and keeping the beat, 9 minus 1 leaves 8 on the beat.
Drummer three was feeling kind of weak. Keeping a beat has got him beat. He stopped playing and keeping the beat. Eight minus one leaves seven on the beat. Drummer four was feeling kind of weak. Keeping a beat has got him beat. He stopped playing and keeping the beat. Seven minus one leaves six on the beat. Drummer five was feeling kind of weak. Keeping a beat has got him beat. He stopped playing and keeping the beat. Six minus one leaves five on the beat. Drummer six was feeling kind of weak. Keeping a beat has got him beat. He stopped playing and keeping the beat. Five minus one leaves four on the beat. Drummer seven was feeling kind of weak. Keeping a beat has got him beat. He stopped playing and keeping the beat. Four minus one leaves three on the beat. Drummer eight was feeling kind of weak. Keeping a beat has got him beat. He stopped playing and keeping the beat. Three minus one leaves two on the beat. Drummer nine was feeling kind of weak. Keeping a beat has got him beat. He stopped playing and keeping the beat. Two minus one leaves one on the beat. Drummer ten was feeling kind of weak. Keeping a beat has got him beat. He stopped playing and keeping the beat. One minus one leaves zero on the beat. of bringing Luzu to you behind the scenes of Main Barn, where you get to see where all the keepers were uh, kind of interacting day in and day out. But today, we're going to show you where the education animals that we house down here at Main Barn live. So, stay tuned. So, as we walk you through Main Barn, this is kind of our back alleyway. And one of our residents that lives back here is Tubbs. Tubbs is a possum, and you can see he's kind of sleeping. Uh, you might meet him in one of the educational programs that Jessica does. And you can tell because he's a little sleepy, he is a possum and he sleeps for most of the day. Uh, he can hear our voice right now, so he's kind of wondering what's going on. But obviously he is uh, pretty sleepy, so he probably won't get up and greet us right now unless we had a special treat for him. So we'll move on and meet some of the other animals that live down here at Main Barn and let him get back to sleep. So now we're going to kind of show you what we refer to as stall two. This is kind of our tortoise hub for the education area. You might meet a few of these guys when Jessica does some programs in the future for Zoo to You, but we wanted to kind of give you guys an idea of where they live and kind of their daily activities. You did catch them on salad day, so you can tell they've definitely already gotten into some of their salad um, and made short work of it. And we do put it on a couple separate trays to make sure that they have uh, enough space that they can eat freely without kind of getting on top of each other. Um, you can also see one of our tortoises nesting right now. So this is kind of a really cool behavior to catch. It's not something you get to see all the time. Um, you can tell that she kind of dug herself down and she's giving you guys a little, a little attention and giving the camera a little love while she's doing that. So they're just kind of moving around and they've got a big space that they can move back and forth and separate. Um, and then if the weather is really nice, sometimes they even get to go outside. In this room, we also have a couple other tortoises that you're going to meet. We have April, that is an ornate box turtle, and we have Hawkeye, and he's a hingeback tortoise. So these are a couple really great species. Um, they're a little bit smaller than the red foot and the yellow foot tortoises that you just saw. Um, but this is kind of where they live, and we just wanted to give you guys kind of an idea of what they eat. You can see their salads. Um, so that's kind of a daily diet that they get Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And this is kind of where they spend their time when they're not out saying hi to you on program. So you saw a couple other areas in the zoo, and now we want to show you what we refer to as stall one. 
So this is another education space that we house some of our reptile animals in. Uh, behind me you can see Carl. And he's a pretty big snake, as far as gopher snake go. Kind of let you guys see him moving around. We do have another snake in here, Jazz, that's currently eating, so um, he's not on his enclosure right now. But we do have an armadillo that we also house in here that you will probably see and meet on program, and his name is JD. And that is short for John Deere. And right now he is very, very active and moving all over the place, and you can tell he's got lots of enrichment in here. And he is just giving you guys all the love and attention, aren't you? So these guys are really, really fast, and he likes to kind of run around. Sometimes he'll push the ball around. He gets different kind of substrate. He gets pine cones, and sometimes we'll stuff those pine cones with different things, but you can tell it's probably hard to track him in the camera, because he definitely, when he gets going, he can move. <laughs> he absolutely loves that. as the small mammal room and we also have a sub area that's a reptile room so we'll go to that after this but we kind of want to introduce you to some of the ed program animals that you might see in future segments and kind of give you an idea of where they live and kind of what they do during the day so this is Mr. Buns and he is a giant Flemish rabbit And we'll see if he kind of wants to hop around. Right now he's very interested in what I'm doing and if I'm going to let me out. And the next area that we're going to kind of show you is our screech owls. So we have two screech owls. Um, one of them is kind of in her box right now. This is Philomena. And she really likes her box. And you can kind of look over here and you'll see Jupiter. And they are sisters. So she's kind of checking out the camera and seeing what it's doing and not really sure about it. But she's a pretty brave one, and you can kind of see her perch swing, and she's also got a little box if she wants to go to sleep. It's a little bit darker in there, and that has a perch in there that she can sit on. And then we do have some sugar gliders. Now these guys are nocturnal, so I'm not sure if we'll be able to see. But this is Bloke, and he is probably buried somewhere back in that paper right now. Uh, we give them a lot of options to sleep during the day since they're pretty active at night. Uh, but you can see he's also got quite a bit of enrichment and we really utilize his enclosure. He's not very big, but he gets a lot of different climbing elements and perching and different types of enrichment and uh, different things that are tactile for him. So we kind of change that up relatively um, often. That way he always has kind of a different environment and it's not kind of the same stack at one but right now he's probably asleep inside that paper area and it'll probably only come out um, when it's time for food or kind of once it starts getting a little bit later and the light goes off and then you'll really see how active he is. And another animal that we have in here you might have seen in some pet stores this is Fernando and he is a chinchilla. He is also kind of sleepy right now. They all had breakfast, now they're kind of sleeping until dinner time. Now it's about lunch time for keepers, so you might start seeing people move around, but for the animals, 
they kind of get free fed lunch throughout the day. So he's kind of sleeping right now. He might come out and play later once he sees that there's a little bit of attention going on. And probably one of the most active animals in the Ed room is our ferret. So ferrets also don't tend to be very active during the day. Um, usually if she kind of hears you talking, you can see the banana hammock that she has starting to move around a little bit. So she's probably gonna pop her head out. There she is. This is Taz and she is a domestic ferret and she absolutely loves attention and playing around with her keepers. She has a very large enclosure also, but she tends to spend most of her day hours um, in kind of one of her hammocks. She, we change out her hammocks pretty often and she'll sleep in those. Um, she loves her tubing. You can see tubing throughout the whole stall. That's a big yawn. And she loves to run through all that series of tubing. So we also change that up so that she's not using the same kind of tunnel system so that she's constantly moving around to different areas and we kind of changed up to make it more interesting for her. Looks like she wanted to come out and say hi. And also, our chinchilla Fernando, he decided to come out and say hi to us as well. This is Fernando. He heard us and woke up. One thing people don't know a lot about chinchillas is they do tend to sleep a lot during the day as you saw but they are really really fast and they can hop and jump so you'll see different levels um, in the enclosure and he is actually able to kind of use those logs and uh, wood perches to jump around and you might see some hay in there he kind of gets some different types of brome hay or timothy hay that he can eat and hopefully he'll show us kind of how he bounces So last up on our tour of the Ed room is the last reptile room. So this is where we keep some of our smaller reptiles and amphibians that we have on program that you might get to meet here in the future. Um, so we might just kind of show you some of the areas. Some of them are out, some of them are not. So we'll see which ones we can kind of get on camera and you guys can meet a little bit up close and personal. But this is a separate room that's enclosed and that way we can control the temperature really well. And these guys, a lot of them get kind of misted daily and we have to keep the humidity and the temperature at kind of an approximate level. And there's some things that you might see in the enclosure, some different enrichments, some humidity boxes. So if you guys see anything and you're not sure what it is or we don't cover it, you wanna know, feel free to ask us um, down in the comments. But we'll just kind of show you guys some of the animals that we have, animal ambassadors here at Rolling Hill Zoo. So we have a prehensile tail skink named Tiny that's up in the top. He's kind of back in that black half barrel, so kind of difficult to see right now. And we also have Rainy. That's a boa. She's kind of hard to see. She's inside, coiled up inside of her um, rock hidey hut. And then we do have a Euromastix named Jack. And Beardy, who you guys I believe have already met. 
and he is definitely making sure he's saying hi for the camera. And we have a giant African bullfrog named Dolores. And that's kind of what they do is dig themselves down. And then in these enclosures, we have a western hognose snake named Arthur Hoggett. And then we have a Pueblo milk snake named Spaz. Spaz is kind of hidden under that milk crate, I think, right now. And then our last animal is Zeus, and he's a bull python. You can kind of see his head from this side. So that's kind of our last area of the tour of Main Barn where you guys got to go behind behind the scenes. And if you guys have any questions about anything that you've seen, or if you want to know any questions from any of our keepers, feel free to drop them in the comments and we'll make sure we get back to you. And uh, hopefully we look forward to seeing you on our next segment of Zoo to You. Bye! Hello, my dear friends. It's me, Bella Beaver, from the banks of the Smoky Hill River. I'm here with my friend, Bartholomew Bullfrog, for a special edition. So excited. Do you realize it's that time in June? This is the time many Salina people get together to enjoy art and live music brought in from all over the country. We engage in fellowship and good food, all in the embrace of the Smoky Hill River in Oakdale Park. It's River Festival Weekend! Yay! Yeah! <laughs> oh, how I miss it! Oh. oh, this was supposed to be its 44th year. Oh man, I miss it too. I miss the good feelings and the and the music and the color. Well, Bartholomew and I wanted to do something special to celebrate the weekend, even though we won't get to celebrate in person. So, we worked up a musical number for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah, get ready for a musical oh. feast for your ears. Well, I wouldn't go that far, although it's true, I'm not too bad of a singer. <laughs> oh, me too, I love to sing. <laughs> now, our dear friend, Miss Ray Blue Heron, was feeling too shy to sing with us, but he is definitely here in spirit. Now, we will be doing a little number called the water cycle to the tune of Albert E. Brumley, All Fly Away. Ooh, I'm so excited. <laughs> oh, you do well. Let's get the show on the road. Everyone ready? Well, if you know the tune and feel like shaking a tail feather, join in. And even if you don't know the song, all right, let's have some fun. <clears throat> The water cycle moves water around the world. How does it move? Up and down and round and round and round. Water moves. It starts on the Keep earth. Around water. The sun warms it up. Evaporation. It becomes water vapor and goes up to the sky. Water moves. The water cycle moves water around the world. How does it move? Up and down and round and round and round. <laughs> water moves. Water vapor it rises. It turns to liquid. Condensation. Becoming clouds that ride with the wind. Water moves. The water cycle moves water around the world. How does it move? Up and down and round and round and round. Water moves. Drop, moves get big and fall down from the sky. 
precipitation, rain and snow and hail and sleet, water moves. The water cycle moves water around the world. How does it move? Up and down and round and round and round. Today's story, Adventures of Ollie and Eddie at the Great Ball of Twine. Story is read by Deborah Cox. Eddie has a best friend named Ollie. Ollie is an orangutan who lives in the tree house in Eddie's backyard. They love to explore the world on their glider. Good morning, Ollie. Are you ready to fly? Yes, indeed, Eddie. It's a beautiful day. See you at the launch pad. So, they climbed aboard their glider named Flapper One. Eddie picked up a banana. That was their phone. Are you ready, Ollie? Absolutely. We are ready for takeoff. They closed their eyes, put their hands in the air, and yelled, Orangutanga zing. Then the wind started to blow and swirl. The glider went sailing into the air. After a while, Ollie was hungry. Ollie forgot to have breakfast. He picked up the phone and decided to eat it. Eddie looked behind him because his co pilot was very quiet. Ollie! You ate the phone. Ollie shrugged his shoulders. Sorry, my tummy was growling. Here's another phone. Eddie always packed extra bananas since he knew his co-pilot always got hungry during, during their flight. Ollie tossed the banana peel out the glider. The banana peel fell through the air. Oh no! Zowie, Eddie said. A flock of geese were flying below them, and the banana peel landed right on top of one of the geese. We have to help them out. The banana peel caused a traffic jam. The air was suddenly filled with the sound of honk, 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 honk. Hi, Mr. Goose. We are so sorry. 
We didn't hear you honking down there. Here are some safety goggles for you. The goose put on the goggles. Honk, honk. You're welcome, Ollie said. Ollie looked through the telescope and saw something round. I see something in the distance. It looks like a gigantic coconut. Ollie usually compared things to fruit. We need to take a look at that. Let's go. As they got closer and closer, Ollie asked, What is that? I don't know, but it sure isn't a coconut. Get ready for landing. They had landed in the small town of Cocker City, Kansas. Wow! That must have taken a long time to roll up all that twine, Eddie said. Look in this book. It says people have come here from all over the world. Wow! It's Jungle Mongus! Ollie found the end of the twine. The wind blew and the twine accidentally got stuck on one of Ollie's buttons. We better start heading back, Eddie said. They hopped in the glider. Eddie picked up the phone. Get ready for takeoff, they both yelled. Oranga tanga zing! The wind picked up and the glider sailed into the sky. After a while, Eddie looked back and saw the twine dangling as far as the eye could see. Oh no, Zowie! I think we just unraveled the world's largest ball of twine. Ollie said, we have to make this right. Yes, we do. Eddie swung the glider around and they went zooming back. The great ball of twine came into view, but it wasn't much of a great ball anymore. They flew around and round, and the ball got larger and larger. Ollie and Eddie felt good that they fixed their mistake all by themselves. They closed their eyes and put their hands in the air and yelled, a ring a tang a zing The wind blew and carried them back home. They were both happy and tired from their adventure. Later that evening, Eddie called Ollie from his room. We always learn something new. We sure do. Sweet dreams, Eddie. And Eddie was dreaming later. I wonder where we'll fly next. Drug. The roar of an engine that's really loud. Drive. 
a monster truck Lots of horsepower under the hood 66 inch tires that stand real tall Four wheel drive that digs in good Spinning fast like a bowling ball Driving a monster truck With great big tires spinning round and round Driving a monster truck Driving over things we won't get stuck Driving a monster truck The roar of an engine that's really loud Driving a monster truck Oh, a monster truck A truck that weighs 10,000 pounds Crushing everything that's in its sight Racing on a track going round and round Going over ramps that are 12 feet high Driving a monster truck With great big tires swimming round and round Driving a monster truck Driving over things we won't get stuck Driving a monster truck The roar of an engine that's really loud Driving a monster truck A monster truck So glad you could join us. Keep watching, there's lots more. All right, well, we'd like to thank you guys for having us. Um, our last segment is going to be a song tribute to one of our favorite shows called Big City Greens. Watch on Disney Channel. And it features uh, brother and sister Tilly and Cricket mm -hmm. featured here in the background. Yeah. Cricket dri dr uh, drawn by Fiona and then Tilly over here Drawing by Rosalind. So we're going to go ahead and sing for you.
Hello, my friends, and welcome once again to Storytime at the Zoo. My name is Miss Lori, and this week we are going to be reading Grendel's Great Escape. Hmm, that looks like a ferret. Now, for those of you who've been to the zoo before, you know that we have a ferret. So let's read the story, and then after it, Miss Jessica's going to bring out the ferret and talk about it, okay? Let's get started. Martin jumped out of bed the second time his alarm sounded. Landing in the midst of some scattered toys, Martin looked frantically around the room. He stumbled over many piles of clothes as he hunted for his favorite monster t-shirt. Hmm. He's in his PJs. It's seven o'clock. Oh, there's that monster t-shirt. Looks like the laundry monster was here last night, Martin mumbled. Oh, I can't worry about that now. I've got to find my backpack. He finally saw the backpack on his desk. On the way to get it, Martin tripped over his skateboard. The laundry monster swayed, threatening to topple over on him. I'd better put those in the closet, Martin thought. Oh, I'll do it later. Before throwing the backpack over his shoulder, Martin tossed in some ferret food and toys. He quickly opened the cage door, hoping to lure Grendel into the front pouch. The ferret made a mad dash toward the door instead. Martin needed him for show and tell. Grendel, however, was not cooperating. Martin finally cornered him in the kitchen. Mom handed Martin the leash and reminded him that ferrets weren't allowed in, uh, allowed, sorry, to run freely around. Oh, there goes Grendel. There's the leash. Goodness. Martin grabbed his backpack and raced toward the school bus. There isn't enough time to put on Grendel's leash, Martin thought. Oh. I'll take care of it later. Perfect timing, Gus commented as he closed the creaky bus door. Martin high-fived his friends as he walked to the back, plopping into the first empty seat he could find. Whoop, there's Grendel. There's all Martin's friends. Later, during art class, Martin splashed colors around on his latest masterpiece. This is a lot of fun, he said. Miss Mason smiled, wide, uh, smiled while carefully avoiding a paint puddle. Time for show and tell, Miss Emily announced after math class. Martin, you will go first. He opened the backpack, reached in, and pulled out, oh my, an empty harness. Grendel has to be around here somewhere, Martin said. Miss Emily shook her head. You better find that ferret before Mr. B sees him running around. Oh boy, there's the art. Oh no, no ferret. The principal was a huge bear of a man whose deep growl could be heard throughout the school. Mr. B prowled the hallways in search of tardy children. Martin planned on staying clear of him. Oh goodness, he kind of does look like a big bear, doesn't he? Oh, he's going around. He had a missing ferret to find. Where should he start? Over by the ball bin? Where could Grendel be? At recess, Martin asked Chris and Maya for help, promising to let them play with the mega monster and mousy balls. They looked in the desks and under the chairs. Maya peeped into the supply closet. Was Grendel hiding in the coats? 
hunting for snacks in Miss Emily's bag, where could Grendel be? He's not there. He's not there. Martin checked the hallway to see if Mr. B was prowling around. He motioned to Chris and, Ma and Maya. Come on, the coast is clear, he said. The search party headed toward the art room. They were eager to see if Grindle was in there, hiding out. Oh, trying to keep away from Mr. B. There's Maya, and there is Chris, and there's Martin. Okay. He's got to be around here somewhere, said Martin. Was Grindel all snug and cozy in the yarn bin? Maybe he was nibbling on the coloring books over by the paints. Where could Grendel be? Martin's tummy rumbled as they entered the cafeteria. The lunch lady ran out of the kitchen with a broom. Shoo, shoo, she shouted out loud. We can't have that animal running around in here. Grendel ran across the tables and through the door. Well, he wasn't in there. They knew, they didn't know. Oh, ho, 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 there's Grindel and he's on a table, a cafeteria table. There's the lunch lady. The frantic ferret ran down a flight of steps and collided into Mo. Grendel scurried to his pant leg and started to climb. Although he was startled, the janitor was quick to react. Get out of there, Mo shouted as he frantically tried to shake Grendel out. Oh, here comes Grendel. And there's Mo, the janitor. Oh no, he's going up a pant leg. Woohoo! He went that way, said Maya, pointing to the teacher's lounge. Grenda was snacking on a cookie when the gym teacher noticed him. Out! Shoo! She shouted out loud. Get out of here! We can't have a ferret among, around, running around here! Martin got there just in time to see Grenda run by. Oh, look! Get out of here, Grenda! Shoo! Shoo! Grenda! Grindel felt right at home in the lost and found room. Unfortunately, it was right next to Mr. B's office. The children had to get Grindel without being seen by the grizzly Mr. B. Once inside, Martin called out to Grindel. Was he in the hoodie bin? Maybe on the toy shelf? Where could Grindel be? Chris spotted the snoozing ferret over by the coat rack. Gotcha, Martin yelled happily, hugging Grendel tight. So look, oh, there he goes in. Oh boy, there's Mr. B. And oh, there he is. There's Grendel sleeping. Martin was finally ready for show and tell. With Grendel's harness securely in place, he showed the class how to play with a ferret. He felt really lucky to have found his pet, and there wouldn't be any growling by the grizzly Mr. B. Oh my, you know, oh, how about, there it is. Oh look, there he is, and he's got his leash on, and show and tell how to take care of a ferret. The end. Well, thank you so much for joining me. And remember, Miss Jessica's next, right now, with the ferret. See you next time. Bye. I want to thank Miss Lori for reading Grendel's Great Escape, featuring the ferret. I have with me today our education ambassador, Miss Taz. She is our domestic ferret. And you know, ferrets are really good at escaping at escaping because they can fit through just about anything that their head can. So they have very flexible bodies and that's why in a lot of countries they're used for what they call ferreting. And that helps them in the wild as well. What ferreting is is they actually send these guys or for ferrets in different uh, 
other countries down into rabbit holes because in other countries rabbits are considered a big nuisance. So they'll send them down and they'll chase the rabbits out because these guys are able to maneuver through those uh, tight burrows and tunnels that the rabbits have. So Taz works very, very hard on her hula dance is what we call it for her. And I'm gonna show you a little bit of her flexible spine here. So there's her hula dance. She works very, very hard at it. So you'll have to let me know and comment below on what you think about her hula dance. She also is very flexible. I can fold her completely in half and as you can see, she's quite comfortable just checking out her surroundings and she doesn't really care. And that's because they have a very flexible spine. That helps them navigate through different uh, tight quarters that we wouldn't be able to. They actually are professionals because in many different um, countries, ferrets are used to go through tight conduit or it's a big fancy word for plastic pipe that wires would go through and they will put on special little harnesses and these guys will go through and pull the wires through because they love to be busy. Now these guys actually sleep 14 to 16 hours a day. Who would like to sleep that long? Now these guys, even though she's cute and cuddly, she's gonna be a carnivore. Now a carnivore is an animal who eats only meat. So she has very sharp teeth and in the wild, they eat small rodents. Now, up until World War II, these guys were used to control the mouse population around the grain bins because since they're carnivores and they eat those mice, these guys were able to help the farmers. They were also thought to be used for NASA uh, to help also put the wires through on the space shuttles. So these guys have a very, very important job, except they got kind of fired from NASA because they kept falling asleep. Like I said, they like to sleep 14 to 16 hours a day. <laughs> now these guys are a relative to a very important ferret that we have here in Kansas, and it's actually the black-footed ferret. These guys are a little bit um, smaller than the black-footed ferret, but not by much. And the black-footed ferrets are actually in Logan County, Kansas, and their diet consists of 91% prairie dogs. Now they'll go down in their burrows at night and they'll eat the sleeping prairie dogs. So that is their main diet. When these guys are gonna be, their main diet is going to be small rodents. These guys can live about five to 10 years. So um, in the wild, they, they live a little bit less because they do have predators. So the black-footed ferrets in the wild live between one to three years. If you guys have any other questions about the domestic ferret or the black-footed ferrets, I encourage you to comment below and we'll be happy to answer your questions. Till next time, friends. Today we're at Wells, Nevada at the Ruby Mountain Ranger District at the first of its kind ribbon cutting ceremony for a pollinator garden. We've taken a sod, thirsty sod grass and converted it to a xeriscape with an array of pollinator friendly plants that are locally adapted to the drought conditions here in the Central Basin and Range ecosystem or ecoregion. One in three bites of food that we take are pollinated by an animal pollinator such as the European honeybee and our native bees and other pollinators. Pollinators fit into the web of life. In some cases they're actually you know the food for other animals and they create through reproduction the berries and fruits and plants that other animals eat. Pollinators are in decline right now. There's been a simultaneous global decline of pollinators, especially the honeybees, 
the native bumblebees and other native bees and the monarch butterfly migration is imperiled right now on both the west coast and the east coast populations. Pollinator gardens help increase awareness to the public and it's a great way to outreach to the public and youth and make them aware of the plights of the pollinators. We are also working to practice restoration on a small scale for the types of restoration we'll be doing on landscape levels. We've got an array of plants. What you want is a number of plants that have different colors and shapes and sizes of flowers and you want them to be biologically active early, middle and late in the flowering season so that the pollinators have food throughout the growing season. Now the public can do their own pollinator gardens and they don't have to have the local genetics but we sure would like to make the seed sources available that are from the Central Basin and Range Eco Region. But you can get involved by uh, planting your own pollinator garden and there's resources out there on pollinator.org where it'll guide you on what plants benefit bees and butterflies which ones specifically benefit monarchs, such as the milkweed that we've planted here. And there's tools and techniques on how to plan your garden and uh, how to keep and maintain it. Let's not lose our pollinators. Let's not lose our food and environmental health. Kids Connection. Make sure you watch it next time.
Kansas is widely thought of as endless croplands to many Americans, but it's actually a land of rugged beauty and diversity. This area, made up of approximately 82,000 square miles, is divided into 11 distinct physiographic regions. Each region tells a unique story about Kansas' geological past. In this film, we'll explore the rugged terrain in central and western Kansas. Specifically, we'll take an in-depth look at two main physiographic regions. The first region is the Smoky Hills, which follows the Smoky Hills River as it carves its way through the central prairies of Kansas. The second region is known as the Gypsum Hills and is located in South Kansas along the Oklahoma border. We'll also be learning about the unique flora and fauna that make up these regions. Bison, which once roamed Kansas numbering in the millions, currently exist in small herds on preserves and private pastures across both the Gypsum and the Smoky Hills. The region known as the Smoky Hills occupies the north-central part of Kansas. It is delineated by outcrops of Cretaceous Age rock and takes its name from the early morning haze that often gathers there in the valleys. There are three main belts that make up this region. The Smoky Hills proper comprise the easternmost belt, with the two western belts often referred to as the Blue Hills. The Dakota Formation forms the eastern region of the Smoky Hills. This area is characterized by outcroppings of sandstone. The other band that we're focusing on in this film is the western band of the Smoky Hills and is represented by chalk beds of the Niobrara Formation. The Dakota Sandstone region of the Smoky Hills is the remains of beach sands and sediments dumped by rivers into the early Cretaceous seas. The hills and buttes in this part of the Smoky Hills, such as Coronado Heights and Twin Mound, are capped by this sandstone and rise sharply from the surrounding plains. Coronado Heights and Twin Mounds were some of the first major landmarks as travelers made their way into the Smoky Hills. One story accounts a pioneer's escape, as a homesteader used a rock overhang on the north summit of Twin Mound as cover to evade a band of pursuing natives. Today, Twin Mound is a short distance from Maxwell Wildlife Preserve in McPherson County. The hills, canyons, and prairie in the preserve provide a perfect habitat for bison and elk to roam very similar to how they existed a hundred years ago. The numbers are not known for exact. There may have been as many as 60 to 80 million of them in North America, along with an, probably an equal number of pronghorns and elk and deer and um, grizzly bear and black bear and mountain lions. I mean, we used to have a, a really amazing uh, megafauna assemblage on the Great Plains. But the, the bison and the uh, pronghorns and the prairie dogs in particular were the three that probably sculpted uh, the Great Plains uh, habitats as, as much as any other animal that lived here. Maxwell's a fun place to visit because they will uh, do tours where they take people out uh, in uh, special vehicles and then they, uh, they lay down some range cubes and the bison like those about as well as cattle do so they'll come up where you can practically reach right out and touch them. It's, it's, <laughs> it's real impressive. One of the best times of year to do that is um, mid to late May after they've dropped their calves because baby bison are about as cute as baby anything and so having them scampering around in addition to the adults, is, it makes it for a lot of fun. West of the refuge is Coronado Heights. Coronado Heights is a part of the Smoky Hills Buttes and is adorned with a castle made from indigenous rock. This Twin Buttes and, and Coronado Heights is really all sort of part of a sort of the eastern edge of the Smoky Hills. Really, that whole area would have been flat, sand covered area. But over time, in the intervening hundred million years, as that area is exposed to erosion, erosion removes the sandstone from in between those hills. So you get outliers of hills that are capped by the Dakota sandstone. Coronado Heights is probably the best one known, but there's even one uh, further east, there's one called Iron Mound, east of Salina, that really is sort of a, uh, a marker saying now you're entering the Smoky Hills. 